Hey y'all, so Epi 633, uh, week five. Um, this is gonna be lecture two, and we're gonna talk about disease eradication and elimination. Uh, so when we talk about, as we talked about in the, in the previous lecture, tropical disease um, actually is somewhat of a contentious uh, category. And so here I want to show you a, a figure of tropical disease, quote, in non-tropical countries. And this is a figure of malaria and shows the various decades uh, where it was eliminated from, from each, each region. And you can see that malaria used to extend all the way uh, into um, areas like New England, Massachusetts, or Michigan, and all the way up to to Finland uh, and, and, and really has only recently uh, been eliminated from all these re regions when in the in sort of grand time scale of things, um, but still persists uh, in areas along the equator. Uh, we also have a fading area of polio, as we can see in this figure, uh, whereas in 1988, uh, polio cases were still happening all around the world, all throughout the, the, the Asian uh, continent, uh, in, even in Western Europe, and down South America and Mexico. And now in 2018, we really only see it uh, in two different regions of the world, northern Nigeria and Afghanistan, Pakistan, and there's been some reports of, of some sporadic cases in the Philippines recently. Um, so the point is, is that, you know, once, you know, at one time these diseases were all around the world, uh, but they have sort of been fading out and fading away from, 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 from life in most places. Smallpox is probably the most famous case uh, where smallpox used to be found all around the world. Uh, was definitely found here in the United States. Was definitely found in New England, particularly during the Revolutionary War. Uh, and then, due to massive public health efforts, funding, and and the cooperation of governments, and scientists, and public health professionals, and communities all around the world, and through a vaccine. Smallpox was eventually eradicated, uh, as in no transmission occurs throughout the world. And we can see in the graph on the right, um, cases occurred uh, all the way up to about 1980, um, and then we don't see it anymore. It's gone. Because smallpox is dead. This is the greatest public health success uh, that, that I can think of. Um, and really is the only case where humans have successfully eradicated a disease or stopped it, uh, stopped its transmission worldwide between humans. Polio uh, is on the way. Uh, it's gradually fading out, um, but what we're finding now is it's really hanging on in the places where it, where it, it still transmits. That is northern, northern Nigeria and Afghanistan, Pakistan. And that's for another number of reasons that, that we're gonna get into. Uh, scientific and political problems really make the home stretch frustratingly difficult. And some have even suggested calling it quits, um, which we're gonna get into in a little bit. Number of infections from eradicable diseases all around the world. Uh, we can see obviously smallpox, uh, as we said, is a major success. Um, but there's diseases like yaws, uh, rabies, guinea worm, um, paralytic polio, and uh, that that are that are declining rapidly, um, but are obviously hanging on where they where they're hanging on. Particularly things like guinea worm and yaws. So let's get some definitions out of the way. Eradication versus elimination. So elimination of disease. Reduction to zero of the incidence of a specified disease in a defined geographic area. And this is important. As a result of deliberate efforts, continued intervention measures are required. Uh, an example of this would be neonatal tetanus, uh, which is eliminated from many countries. Um, and the key word here is defined geographic area. Elimination is a local occurrence. Elimination of infections, reduction to zero of the incidence of infection caused by a specific agent in a defined geographic area as a result of deliberate efforts. Continued measures to present, prevent reestablishment of transmission are required. Examples of this would be measles and polio, um, where uh, vaccines have, have prevented transmission of, of polio uh, or measles in many cases, um, but we need concerted efforts to keep, uh, keep, keep that situation going. Now, eradication. Permanent reduction to zero of the worldwide incidence of infection caused by a specific agent as a result of deliberate efforts. Intervention methods, measures are no longer needed. An example here, and the only example, is smallpox. 
And so you could think of this as eradication is worldwide, elimination is local. That's really the difference between the two. And eradication uh, doesn't require the proactive efforts of, of public health bodies to prevent transmission, uh, and elimination does. Extinction. The specific infectious agent no longer exists in nature or in the laboratory. There's no example of this. Smallpox still exists in laboratories in the United States and Russia, um, partly to, due to an agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States uh, back during, during, during uh, the era when uh, governments were, were sort of oddly cooperating um, to make this happen. Um, and of course, the United States and the Soviet Union did not trust each other, and each, each agreed to maintain stores of, of smallpox in case one or the other created some sort of bioterror weapon. Of course, the existence of the smallpox in labs uh, means that the possibility of bioterror uh, is, is there all the time. We hope that it doesn't happen, but the possibility is there. So there is no uh, situation where extinction has actually occurred as a result, result of deliberate efforts by humans. So barring elimination, barring the possibility of eradication, uh, barring the, the possibility of extinction, um, there is control. The redu reduction of disease incidence, prevalence, morbidity, and mortality to a locally acceptable level as a result of deliberate efforts. Continued intervention methods are required to maintain the reduction. So elimination and eradication are both expensive prospects. They require lots of cooperation, lots of effort, lots of funding. So often control is seen, seen as, 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 as a better, a more cost-effective and more um, um, sort of feasible method. And these are all from the CDC. So you can go on their website and see these definitions there. Eradication versus elimination. So the question here is why is eradication so difficult? Uh, what are the possible factors that might make eradication difficult, if not impossible? And the first is animal reservoir. So if a pathogen exists uh, in animals, um, it's obviously, well, maybe not so obviously, it's, 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 it's relatively impossible uh, to, to, to eradicate um, because there's always the possibility of zoonotic transmission. And we're seeing the, this in the case of guinea worm, uh, where it was thought that we could eradicate guinea worm, but then it was discovered that, that, that dogs uh, can also be infected with guinea worm. And this might complicate efforts to eradicate, which would lead us to back to elimination and possibly to control. Um, vaccines. Um, eradication efforts are very difficult without vaccines for, for vir viruses and bacteria. Uh, and if a vaccine doesn't exist, um, it might complicate our efforts to, to eradicate. Uh, pathogenic change, mutation, obviously influenza um, is a category for this, where eradication of influenza would be relatively difficult because it changes from year to year and vaccines are, are only partially effective. Uh, human behavior complicates things. I mean, as we're seeing in the COVID-19 era, um, resistance to masks, uh, for example, uh, is, is, you know, you can't discount um, human behavior for, for sure. Um, humans have to buy into the idea of controlling the public health. And this has been true all throughout history. It takes the effort of governments, scientists, public health bodies, and also communities and community members um, to make these things happen. Uh, political factors, uh, obviously we're going to talk about this in a second, po political, if the governments aren't behind it, then eradication efforts really can't happen because we require government buy-in for these things. Uh, and also a number of other factors. <clears throat> Principal indicators of eradicability. Um, the first is uh, an effective intervention is available to interrupt transmission of the agent. It has to be, there has to be some method of eradicating disease, some sort of prevention uh, or, or a vaccine or a treatment that's going to prevent uh, the, the disease from transmitting again. So if a method doesn't exist, then we can't eradicate. Uh, practical diagnostic tools with su sufficient sensitivity and specificity are available to detect levels of infection that can lead to transmission. We have to be able to detect cases. We have to be able to know who is infected um, before we can consider isolating them and, and preventing them from transmitting to others. Uh, certainly in COVID-19's uh, situation, uh, there's a long incubation period, a long period between, long latency period between 
uh, initial infection and um, um, signs of symptoms, and during that period, people may be able to happily transmit. So the possibility of eradicating in that case becomes difficult because we do not actually know who to target. They're just out there transmitting to people happily. And third, humans are essential for the life cycle of the agent, which has no other vertebrate res reservoir and does not amplify in the environment. So this is what we said before. Um, if a pathogen is transmissible between animals, then the possibility of eradication is basically nil. Smallpox was uh, sort of a, a prime candidate for eradication because vaccine existed. Uh, the latency period was quite short and by the, by the symptoms were very obvious. There were no sort of light uh, smallpox cases in most cases. And also we were the only uh, host for smallpox. Economic considerations. Eradication is expensive. Elimination is expensive. Uh, intervention efforts might present significant cost burdens to countries with limited resources. Uh, cost of elimination eradication might outweigh the public health benefits. And this is, this is the most important part. Health funding is a zero sum game. Devoting resources to one program takes away from another. We can look on this graph of polio funding over years, and we can see that more and more and more and more money is being put into polio, whereas cases are going fewer and fewer and fewer all the time. Um, and so the question is, is like, does that expense justify the outcome? We're taking money away from other public health programs. Uh, and by doing that, uh, we might be uh, sort of reducing the public health benefit of those programs. So that's, that's a discussion that has to be made. And the final question is, who pays? Who pays for these programs? Um, local, local governments in developing countries are basically just trying to keep the lights on with their health systems and treating the everyday common diseases like malaria or, or diarrheal disease or childhood disease of all kinds, reproductive health, and really do not have the luxury of being able to devote resources uh, into, into thing, things like polio, which the final cases are just costing lots of money. And developed country governments might sort of balk at the idea of paying more and more money for developing country health systems. And we're seeing that a lot in 2020 uh, in the United States and other countries who are having debates about how much we, we should pay. So I'm not, a, I'm, well, I wouldn't say I'm not on either side of this. I am on the side that I think that, that wealthy countries should pay, um, but it's a, it's a legitimate debate to be had for sure. As diseases near eradication, costs tend to go up. Easy to eliminate malaria from a place like Finland, for example, uh, but not so easy to eliminate malaria from a place like the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a huge uh, prime area for holoidemic transmission of malaria and, and filled with isolated populations that are difficult to get to. And if we look at this graph uh, from The Economist, which is used, uh, maybe, I don't know if they've used the word eradication incorrectly here, it's sort of hard to judge their intent. Uh, but the cost of elimination per country goes up as the number of countries with malaria go down. And so, you know, when you're in the final stretch of any disease, it's going to cost you more and more and more money, for sure. And sort of that's a, a question, like when does the money run out? How long can countries sustain paying for this? And would that put us in a situation where control is actually a better option? There's also social and political dimensions. Uh, we see here a, a figure of Pakistan um, and, and vaccine refusal for polio. Uh, it's, it's difficult in some cases to get buy-in from communities that are, that, are, that, are, that are already skeptical of their own governments or skeptical of international organizations or are sort of what do you have, ethnically isolated areas. This, these can be difficult as well. Power disparities can, can, can complicate efforts to provide public health and provide vaccination efforts, even if you explain the public health benefits to them. Uh, not interve all interventions will be acceptable everywhere. Vaccines are controversial in some areas, even here in the United States. Uh, distrust in government, pharma, and healthcare workers, even a problem here in the United States. You can imagine what it's, what it's like in, 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 in developing countries um, where uh, there's ethnic enclaves that, that have long histories of, of friction between um, um, the, the central governments or the, the, the main um, ethnic group in power. Uh, and interventions themselves might cause significant disruptions to society. 
So we have to consider all those things. They can also all complicate uh, eradication efforts. Again, political di di dimensions, uh, warfare uh, is a major problem. Can you deliver public health services during a war? It's very difficult to do in some cases. Um, dysfunctional states in general have sort of rickety health systems uh, that they're sort of, you know, can in some ways, in some some ways, some some uh, instances have very few ways of, of generating revenues, but have to provide health services, and there's not a whole lot of leadership from the government, and they're depending on inter international aid sources, and and I can tell you, in, in places like Kenya or Malawi or Tanzania or wherever, uh, it gets complicated really quickly. Eradication itself requires the cooperation of government, scientists, and the private sector, and communities who often have incongruous goals. It's difficult to get all those people to the table uh, and agree on something, even in normal times. And, and asking for, for something huge like, like disease eradication uh, is, is, is complicated, to say the least. And power disparities themselves can complicate eradication efforts. So, Right now, uh, there's only a few diseases that are, that, are, that are looking like possibilities to be eradicated. Uh, we have guinea worm here, polio, uh, lymphatic filariasis, malaria. I, you know, it's on the eradication agenda. It's definitely on the elimination agenda. Um, I'm not sure if we'll ever get to eradication, but we'll see. Hopefully, I'm, I'm, my skepticism is, is unfounded. Uh, and then, of course, river blindness. And so we're going to talk about those when we talk about tropical diseases. So, eradication, it failed, now what? Uh, cost of eradication must include discussions of feasibility, costs, and benefits. Uh, sometimes a strategy of, a control, of control might be more feasible and less costly. Uh, for example, malaria, the tools to control malaria are cheap, uh, medications and treatment exist. Um, in the absence of an effective vi vaccine, control might, might be the best option. And so we're looking at this graph here, um, and we can see in, if, at the beginning, uh, the cost of eradicating are very, very high, uh, and then it becomes less and less over time. But this is sort of a, you know, somewhat optimistic. You know, can we get to that point? Can we get to that time point where they, where they cross over? And that's not, al not always easy to do. And in the case where eradication efforts just cost too much, control might be a more feasible and economic option for uh, developing countries for sure. Okay, so that is it about eradication and elimination. Remember, elimination is local, eradication is global. Um, eradication might be costly, and so control efforts uh, might, might be preferable. Uh, yeah, so thank you. And if you have any questions, please uh, write me because I am here to help you.